never been to Niagara Falls, you need to go. It is something to see, to stand on the banks of that water uh, and even to come up into the horseshoe on a boat and to see the power and the majesty of God's creation. It was just all striking, and uh, so thank you for allowing me to go and to be a part of that. I want to say thanks to Truman and Jan for putting together such a great trip, and, and our group that went, we had a wonderful time, saw a lot of people eat a lot of ice cream, and uh, so some of them may be coming forward this morning uh, to repent. So what, if you see that, just know that's the reason why. I also want to say a word of thanks to, uh, to Jim and to Mike for uh, filling in and preaching on, uh, in my absence fully capable of always taking care of those responsibilities. You know this, I remind you often. We have an amazing pastoral team and uh, an admin team here, and we are uh, truly blessed, and I appreciate each and every one of them. Uh, Jim is going to be preaching next week. I'm going to be out of pocket again, and he's going to be kicking off a series for us called The Age of Heroes, and I hope that you'll be here. I know it's summer. I know we're in and out a lot of times, but if you're in town, you be here on a Sunday morning, okay? I, um, I've tried all week, though, to put into words what the past year has been like for the Ashley family. And I, I keep coming back to one word, and so allow me just a moment uh, to express this to you. And that one word is overflowing. That might seem kind of strange, might seem a little bit of a different word to use, but um, it describes our journey uh, over this past year with you. I think it's rather fitting. We are overflowing with love for you. Uh, we are overflowing with blessings from you. We are overflowing with joy because of you. And so uh, we thank you for that. Um, I, I looked up the word, the, the definition of the word overflowing, and it means to be filled beyond capacity. And so now you begin to understand why I think that word is, is so critical and, and uh, important to us. I'm overflowing with gratitude uh, to God for our amazing staff and leadership team and the life-changing ministries, my friends, that they lead day in and day out, week after week. Um, they're, they're remarkable people. Last Tuesday... Uh, was the first day I was back in the office after being out for 10, 11 days. And we took time in our staff meeting, our staff gathering, to pause and to reflect on all of the amazing things that, friends, God has accomplished this past year through the, the work of, of you and the work of our team. And, uh, and I'm overflowing with amazement and with, uh, again, gratitude at the work of his hands. There was only really one passage of scripture that uh, can uh, describe our feelings, the Ashley family's feelings for you. And so let me just uh, steal the words of Paul to the Philippians in chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. And we looked at the book of Philippians on our Niagara trip. Paul said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you. Because I have in you my heart. We love you and we thank you. And what an amazing, amazing gift to serve as your pastor. Well, three words were spoken to our family uh, prior to our family joining Bacon Heights, and then we have carried these three words on. And those three words are a new day. I tell our new members class each time that we meet that a new day is not something we simply say. It really is something that we believe. It's something we take to heart. And when we say a new day has come, a new day has arrived, it's all about a new day, new opportunities. We began studying a series called Discovering Your Story just a few weeks ago. And we know that our story is a result of God's love for us because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You remember when we looked at that great passage in Psalm. All of the story that God has built within us that we discover began at creation when God breathed life into us and we do not take that for granted 
two weeks ago on Graduate Sunday, you studied how God has a story planned for you, a plan to prosper you, a plan to give you hope and a future. That's part of your story, and it's critical to understanding that. And then last week, you looked at how your past does not dictate how your story ends. Sometimes, past circumstances, past mistakes, we can use those against ourselves and we think, God can't do anything with me or my story is not going to turn out the way that it should. And your past does not dictate how your story ends. God can rewrite that. God can change that. God can use that and mold it to shape you to develop a new story within you. And so this morning, as we bring this particular series to a close, I think it's important as we look at how we have culminated this one year together, that a new story brings a new day. Look with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's begin in verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, if we talk about a new story for a new day, you have to begin where Paul says in this particular passage with a new look. Now, there's a word that's being used here that's not written in my translation that might be written in yours. I'm reading from New American Standard this morning. But Paul's referring to a word that we call transformation. Now, our world is infatuated with transformation. It's called looks. I've lost track of all the shows on television describing how you can be a new you in 40 days or walk yourself to a new you. We have extreme makeover shows, extreme weight loss shows, and even extreme dating shows all based on how you look. And Paul is saying here that a new story for a new day begins with a new look and it's transformation. But my friends, This particular transformation has nothing to do with physical appearance. You see, spiritual transformation is the outward results of an inward change. And when God gets a hold of your life, you get a new look and your story is new and it's fresh and it's different. When the world wants change, they get a new hairdo, new clothes, Or a new spouse. As soon as the novelty wears off, they get bored and change something else about themselves. Jay Douglas says these words. Wouldn't it be great as you get older if you could get new parts? (laughs) Yes, I know that through the magic of modern medicine, you can get a makeover. You can have all kinds of things stretched, pulled, pinched, tucked, tweaked, enhanced, suctioned, and peeled. But all that is only a matter of moving pieces and parts around so that no one can see the effects of how badly we treat our bodies. You see, some of you need a new look today, and it has nothing to do with your physical appearance. It's the transformation. Paul says in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. God wants to give you more than a makeover. God wants to create a brand new person. He wants to write a new story to give you an entirely new look. And God is not interested in redecorating. 
Some of us think maybe we just need to change the furniture in our rooms or we need to add a little paint on the walls and redecorate things. When it comes to your life, you don't need redecorating, you need transformation. Something has to change, something has to give for this new look to take a permanent place. See, God wants to change you so radically that everyone around you notices that something is different. Something is changed. And it's because that you have decided you're going to live life differently than the world says you should live. You're going to look differently than the world says you should look. You're going to be bombarded later today. You probably have been every time you turn on the television about how you can change yourself. And Paul says you change yourself by becoming a new creation. Not a weight loss program. Not a makeover of physical appearance, facial looks, a new hairdo. All those things are great, but eventually they fade. You live life different when you're a new creation. And there's a new look to the way that you adventure out into this world. There's a new look to the way that you treat people. There's a, a new perspective in the way that you have in the career, and the job, and the family that God has placed you in. It's the opposite of the way the world says you find happiness. It's opposite of the way the world says that if you change something about your appearance, you'll feel better about yourself. That's temporary. That will fade into the wind. A new look for you begins by understanding that God makes you new did you see how Paul referred to this fleshly appearance in verse 16 from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh we don't recognize people based on their appearances and their looks but what is happening on the inside the transformation the outward results of the inward change of their life how has God established a new look in you? Has, have you allowed Him to, to develop and bring about this new look, this change in your life, this, this makeover that goes beyond these fleshly appearances, as Paul says? This could be a new day for you. Because when God gives you a new start, He writes a new story, He makes you a new creation. I've mentioned already that makeovers are temporary. What is mortal may be swallowed up by life. <laughs> you can get a tan this summer and for a few months it'll last. If you get a new hairdo, it lasts until the first time you wash it. <laughs> and after that, you can't quite get the look just right like you had when you left the hair salon, can you? I'm finding this out to be true with my father. If you put hair color in, as it grows, the gray will go once again. Lose weight. Becomes easy to regain that weight, doesn't it? Any change you make to your physical appearance is temporary. But friends, change that God makes in your life is eternal. It's everlasting. And part of this idea of discovering your story is to know that a new look makes you a new creation. Well, let's pick up in verse 18 here as we look back at the Scriptures. And I want you to underline as I read, read these two passages, 18 and 19 again, every time you see the word reconciled. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation four times in two verses he gives us a new ministry a ministry of reconciliation the story is told of two brothers who lived on adjoining farms but they one day had a very deep quarrel and conflict between them 
They had often shared their resources, but that practice came to an immediate halt, and there was nothing but bitterness left between these brothers. One morning, one of the brothers named John answered a knock at his door. and It was a carpenter. The carpenter asked if there was any work that he needed done on the farm. John said that there was something that he could do, and so he took the carpenter down the carpenter to where the two properties and the property line met, and he showed him where his brother had taken a bulldozer and had created this creek where the meadow used to be. And John said, I know he did this to make me angry. And I want you to help me get even and get revenge with him by building a fence so I won't have to see his property ever again. So the carpenter began his work and he worked all day on this project. And when he reported back to John, John noticed that there was not a fence that had been built. Rather, the carpenter had used his skills to build a bridge over the creek. John's brother peeked out his window and saw the bridge, and he was moved by his brother's embrace. And he would go across, and the two would meet in the middle, and they would reconcile their differences. Well, the carpenter began packing his tools and making his way to another journey. And the two brothers saw him leaving and asked him to stay a little while, to to be with them and to have a meal with them. The carpenter said, I'm sorry, I must go. I have other bridges to build. Paul, looking back on this new attitude in his life, this new look, an eternal makeover that God had given to him, It flows by his understanding that he is a new creation. And he says, when he came to Christ, he received a brand new reason for existing. And that reason is to be a bridge builder. Look at what he says. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of of reconciliation. I want to go back and read these two passages, but I want to make this a little more personal so you begin to understand the true reality of this new ministry that God has given to us. Now all these things are from God who reconciled me to himself through Christ and gave me the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting my trespasses against me, and he has committed to me the word of reconciliation. Do you understand how personal he is making this? A man who had spent the majority of his life at this point bashing and shaming the name of Jesus Christ and Christianity as we understand it today. And Paul says, the one who has reconciled him The one who built a bridge so that Paul could come to know Jesus Christ did not count his trespasses against him, but in turn has given him the ministry of being a bridge builder so that other people might come to know Jesus Christ. Do you realize, friends, it's the same ministry that he's given to you? Christ does not hold your trespasses against you. And Paul says... Once you find your way across the bridge and you come to Jesus Christ through grace and truth and mercy, you now become a bridge builder. You have been given the ministry, a partner in the word of reconciliation. You might build a bridge so that somebody else would come to know Christ. It's a powerful opportunity that you've been given. Jesus became sin for us in order that we might have the righteousness necessary for us to enter into a right relationship with a holy God. God did something pretty amazing. He gave Paul and He gives us the opportunity to participate in this ministry. 
And maybe you've been wrestling for a while. What's the ministry that God's calling me to? I don't feel led to call, uh, led to work with children or called to work with youth or called to help in VBS. What is the ministry God's calling me to? Here it is, friends. Ministry of reconciliation. Talk about a fresh start. Talk about a new story. Talk about a new day. One who had been the enemy of God had now been recruited by God Himself to bring others into a right relationship with Christ. And He calls you friend. He invites you in to the bridge building process. And we need to be a church that builds bridges, that loves people, that reconciles whatever differences may be on either side of the aisle. Our responsibility is to make it possible for people to get from where they are to where they can clearly see Jesus. Romans 5.11 says, we also exalt God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Paul would say again in Colossians 1, verse 22, He now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Who is it? that you need to build a bridge to today so that they might see Jesus more clearly, that they might discover their story and how they are fearfully and wonderfully made, that they might discover that God has a plan for their life, hope and a future, that they might discover as you have that your past does not dictate your future when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then the final thought this morning is that we receive on a new day a new title. Look at verse 20. Therefore we are ambassadors. Underline that word ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. There it is again. And He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. You have a new title. And as ambassadors for Christ, we are not simply proclaimers of the gospel. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. Understand that. Paul considered himself an ambassador of Jesus. Do you understand what an ambassador is? From our worldly understanding, we know that an ambassador is an authorized representative of sovereign, of, of something that is sovereign. And he speaks not only in his own name, but on behalf of the ruler whose deputy he is, who, who he answers to. And his whole duty and responsibility is to interpret what the ruler's mind faithfully is to those that he is sent to. An ambassador is an envoy or a minister or state that is sent on a mission by a sovereign state to one another. A spokesperson, a representative of one state to the other that speaks with authority. And so when you take that concept and you realize what Paul is saying, that as ambassadors for Christ and ambassadors of Christ, we have been authorized and clothed with divine authority and power to speak the reconciling message of the love of Jesus Christ to the unsaved world. It is a big, big job. And it's a new title that you and I have been given. We are representatives of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are the stand in the courts of human conscience authoritatively representing the power of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you a story as we close. A well-known pastor was preaching at the North Shore Baptist Church in Chicago. And he was entertained at the home of a man named James L. Kraft. 
the founder of Kraft Foods. Kraft said that as a young man, he had a desire to be the most famous manufacturer and salesman of cheese in the world. He planned on becoming rich and famous by making and selling cheese and began as a young fellow with a little buggy pulled by a pony named Patty. After making his cheese, Kraft would load his pony and his wagon and they would drive down the streets of Chicago to sell cheese. As the months passed, young Kraft began to despair because he was not making any money in spite of his long hours and hard work. And one day, he pulled his pony to a stop and he began to talk to him. You ever done that? <laughs> talk to an animal? And he said, Patty, there's something wrong here. We're not doing it right. I'm afraid we have things turned around. Our priorities are not where they ought to be. Maybe we should serve God and place Him first in our lives. Kraft then drove home and made a covenant that for the rest of his life, he would first serve the Lord, and then he would work at how God directed him and gifted him. Well, many years after this, James Kraft is quoting as saying, I'd rather be a layman in the North Shore Baptist Church than to be the head of the greatest corporation in America. My first job is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Friends, when you discover your story, when you discover that you are a new creation or that you can be a new creation, you discover that this ministry of reconciliation goes across the aisles and it really is for all of us to partake of, to be bridge builders to an unsaved world. You discover that you have a new title, the title of ambassador of Jesus Christ, one who speaks with authority to those who might see Jesus more clearly. Jesus said, in Revelation 21 5 behold I make all things new and my friends that includes you let's pray together father this morning we reconcile to you that in times we have not represented you well and so, Father, I pray that you would help us as a good reminder, or maybe for the first time, to realize in our lives that we're a new creation. You give us a new story for a new day. New opportunities, Father, to, to represent you to this lost and dying world. An opportunity to speak truth to those who have yet to come to an understanding of the grace that they need in their life. God, I pray for every person in this room and in this community who has spent a lot of time making over themselves. All those fleshly appearances. Yes, there's something to be said for that. But Father, you have come to transform our lives and the outward results of those things is an inward change that happens when you come in and you remodel a new creation Lord we praise you I thank you Father for loving us may we hold the banner high as ambassadors Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Time of invitation.